wonderful we should now be recording. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chelsea Geralda Armstrong here. Chelsea's an ethnobiologist looking into historical ecological relationships in Simshan and Kitsan territories with a focus on traditional resource and environmental management. She earned her PhD from Simon Fraser University, where she's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Indigenous Studies. Chelsea's work in what has recently been called British Columbia has been supported by Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, National Geographic, National Science Foundation, and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, among many, many others. And it combines approaches from archaeology, ecology, molecular biology with that really deep, important, meaningful sense of relationships with people and other living beings across this landscape, those things that are fundamentally shaped by a combination of indigenous action and settler colonialism over a period of centuries. Her research can be found in all the places where we hope to see ethnobiology, from our own close conversations in the field like Ethnobiology and Medicine, the Journal of Ethnobiology and Ethnobiology Letters, to interdisciplinary conversations around social and natural sciences like American Anthropologist, Journal of Archaeological Sciences, Ecology and Society and Frontiers, to her impactful writing in science and her books, plural, on historical ecology in the Americas. And we love and appreciate these impressive, fancy, scholarly accolades, but she's here to kick off our series because this work is ferociously committed to doing this work of understanding our shared, dynamic world in ways that support First Nation claims to land and sovereignty that diversify and democratize the knowledge of the world around us, that vest data and its ownership with those communities who keep it, who create it, who are it. In just one of these projects on so-called forest gardens, she counters that most nihilistic of claims about humans in our environment, that it is human nature to limit or harm the world, human nature rather than colonial violence or the desire to grow capital rather than life. Not so through a combination of ecology and spatial analysis and listening to those First Nations experts and elders. Chelsea helped to amplify this message that indigenous stewardship enhances the possibilities for life to thrive in fundamental ways that still manifest in the present despite and through the violence and displacement of centuries of settler colonialism. Chelsea told me that this meeting has been her intellectual home since her very first one in 2011, and boy, are we fortunate to have her. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Chelsea Gerard Armstrong Hey, thanks, Andrew. That's um, a really kind and nice introduction. And I'm just flipping through all the folks that are here. And I'm delighted to to see everyone and to, to be part of this great speaker series that uh, you, Andrew, Daniela, and Steve have kicked off. And so with that, let's talk about where people, history, and ecology meet, a broad title, but uh, meaningful, I think, in some ways that I'll discuss today. So for decades now, ethnoecologists have studied, abstracted, and tinkered with this idea of cultural landscapes. These are the kind of spatial units that encompass the broadest possible range of a society's behaviors, histories, and interactions with the outside world. But in settler nations like Canada, cultural landscapes like this one here in Lechyap Kitsas, in some Shan territory in Northwestern BC, so-called BC, cultural landscapes here are really uh, just vastly interconnected networks of people's homelands that include everything from trails and roads uh, to tended and managed forests and grasslands, cultivated shores and home places. So those are kind of the material infrastructures, but it also includes more than material infrastructures uh, that constitute placemaking. So these are things like governance, ownership, land-based laws, and genealogies. And as many of you are, are long-standing ethnoecologists and some just budding ethnoecologists, you'll still, you'll have internalized this concept of cultural landscapes and that taken together over space and through time, uh, ancient and ongoing human placemaking and steward practice have helped to shape most, if not all, landscapes on Earth. And outside of our own field or within community, many researchers are starting to recognize this, to recognize what Indigenous peoples have always known 
that cultural homelands, including land use and stewardship practices, have a disproportionately greater role in maintaining and stewarding uh, some of the most biologically and functionally diverse ecosystems on Earth. And so even the IPCC now recognizes the critical role of Indigenous peoples as guardians of the world's lands and forests. And so this includes um, some trends like lower deforestation rates, lower carbon emissions, higher carbon storage, uh, more equitable and sustainable forest restoration efforts. Generally, just more benefits for more people um, and better social and environmental outcomes on Indigenous owned lands versus public or private lands, including protected areas. And this, again, it's relatively new in the broader scientific realm in our field, of course, it's something we've been thinking about for a long time, but this is all in step with decolonial thinking that has existed since the, the inception of colonization. Uh, but there has been a, a pretty profound and mainstream shift since the 1990s, right? This idea, the, the kind of growing disillusion with modernization and technology, which is all still unfolding now. And so this is an unfinished project known as the decolonial turn. And we can think of this turn as a, a, a really fundamental counterpoint to accelerated rhythms of capitalism and colonial expansion, especially around land and human labor. This is, this is a fundamental shift only in the last few decades in mainstream society. But again, it's clear that this kind of, you know, decolonization or whatever you want to call it uh, will remain unfinished for some time because despite this increasing awareness among researchers and even mainstream society, Indigenous people's homelands are still virulently contested spaces and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. For example, in the Pacific Northwest of North America, despite decades of research on the topic by folks like Nancy Turner and, and her many, many um, community partners and colleagues, the notion of Indigenous people's homelands as culturally mediated and influenced spaces is still challenged. It's challenged in our courts, in public policy, in environmental regulation. And this stems in, in large part uh, from the last hundred years of how people's history was written. There's, many of you are probably aware that for over a century, the Pacific Northwest was kind of a hot spot for anthropologists. They'd come from around the world to study societies here. And they were often perplexed by the fact there were, you know, densely occupied societies and complex stratified societies, all with monumental architecture and public works, but all without the development of agriculture or what we would know as extensive land use. And this idea, of course, that the hunter-gatherer and this sort of thing was perpetuated then by successive generations of researchers who knowingly or not contributed to this erasure of people from their homelands. Uh, but we do know from piecemeal ethnographies and indigenous scholars who have been saying for generations that people actively constructed, managed, and engineered local environments. People were burning, tilling, pruning, seed broadcasting, transplanting, mulching, fertilizing. And this resulted in what are still referred to today as wild ecosystems, places like managed berry groves, Gary Oak ecosystems, Camas prairies, and more recently forest gardens, which I'll talk about in a minute here. So just going back to this question of, of um, you know, assumptions and, and how to unlearn some of these deeply held assumptions about people's homeland, you know, one of the obvious things we can do as researchers is, is work to reject those assumptions. And data is a really fun way to do this, even if it's only what we would call trace-centric snippets that we can piece together. For example, this is um, just an incredible paper that was recently published by Schwartz et al. And they assessed stable carbon isotope ratios in human bones from ancestral Tsimshian archaeological sites spanning a thousand years. And so this research showed that people, or sorry, plant foods, constituted more than 60% of the energy content in people's diets. And these are outer coast 
communities who were previously thought to have relied almost exclusively on marine foods for their diets. And so taking a snippet like that and asking, you know, okay, if that's the case, then how can we investigate or document the material signatures of those kinds of legacies, right? If Simsham people on the coast, one of the densest occupied societies north of California before the onset of colonialism, if they were utilizing plants for the overwhelming majority of their diets and in trade, how are they doing that? How do these relevant plants and ecosystems form part of the Tsimshian cultural landscape? And again, this is a, a trace-centric science, so it's a challenge, especially uh, as we go further and further back through time, these traces get scanter and scanter. But also, as resource extraction continues at an incredibly unfettered rate in BC, especially northern BC, cultural landscapes continue to be erased. And so considering all this, with the rest of the time we have together, I'm going to highlight some of the ways in which my colleagues Yvonne and I have worked to, you know, just from a pure methodological stance, you know, develop a, a succinct ways to look at practices like land use stewardship and the like. And we do this in a way that fundamentally seeks to challenge colonial narratives and perspectives about land and people. But again, trace-centric science. Um, if people's stewardship practices aren't resulting in massive you know, net turnover of local species, these can be hard to spot. And so one of the approaches we use is to just very basically start with a contemporary landscape, look at a landscape today and ask how did it get this way? And the key here is to look at both cultural and biophysical processes and where neither is necessarily the protagonist. This is essentially where people, history and ecology meet. So for example, to document historical and ancient forest management in the Pacific Northwest, some of the things we might look for are plants associated or plant communities associated with archeological village sites, plant species growing outside their natural range or natural habitat, plant assemblies that are more rich or more diverse, and plant assemblies that are ethno-botanically significant. Focusing on, on this idea of plants growing outside their natural range or habitat, we can key on on certain practices like transplanting and translocations. And while some plant ranges in the Americas appear to be wild, they are in fact the result of ancient human management and transplanting people kind of moving favorable species throughout homelands throughout time. And so based on some of Nancy Turner's important work, uh, we compiled these lines of evidence in the Pacific Northwest spanning various spatial and temporal scales. So we looked at linguistic evidences, oral histories, phytogeographic industry, indis, uh, indices. And we concluded that where a species was referenced in three or more lines of evidence, it was a good candidate for thinking about human assisted movement. So some of the species included Saskatoons, soapberry, camas, black hawthorn. And I'll give you a, an example here with hazelnut. So hazelnut's a very interesting example for those of you that have come to the conferences over the last few years. This is something I've talked about a few times, might be familiar to you. Hazelnut is the only native nut tree to British Columbia, and it was used and is still used for all sorts of things, food, medicine, oil, dye, uh, and other technologies. And we find remains at archaeological sites throughout the province. We also know that it was managed. This is Marion Dixon, Walchaco, and then Klikatmach Elder. And as is true with many elders who retain their language and knowledge, um, you know, she was able to, to escape residential school. And so she grew up with her grandparents, as she says, in the bush, burning and transplanting hazelnut throughout the Spuzzin region down here in southwestern BC. And of course, we would refer to all of this as, as wild hazelnut. Yeah, she's assured me a number of times that half the hazelnut in the Coquihalla is there because of her and her family. And so this is the, the modern or contemporary distribution of hazelnut in the province. 
There's this interior variety of Cornuta Cornuta, uh, a California variety that grows basically from the lower mainland of BC here to the uh, down to, to Northern California. But there's also this Northwestern isolate and it's been presumed to be a, a disjunct or remnant population from a previously larger distribution with the interior, you know, a geological event or something like a glacier perhaps cut it off from a previously larger distribution. The only problem with that theory is that the Northwestern groups, uh, our group of hazelnut looks different. It doesn't look like this interior variety. And then there's some other even sub pockets in here that they look a little more different, just their, their basic kind of branching density and nuts per cluster. And so if you look at the paleobiolinguistics, which was part of Nancy Turner's work, it also showed a, an interesting pattern. Um, the Gixan, which is a language in that some Shianic language family, the word for hazelnut is skan ek. So skan referring to any, any shrub and ek referring specifically to the nut, which is very similar to the Proto-Salish and Squamish word for hazelnuts ek. And these are entirely different language families. So, you know, it's impossible that they're cognates. And the idea was it was very likely a lone word and perhaps a lone nut. And so that compelled us to further investigate this distribution. And so we collected leaf tissues from throughout the province representing all of these uh, populations. And we looked at the genetic structure of populations using genotyping by sequencing. And this is the results. We're, what we're probably looking at is a fairly normalized haplotype distribution in the south. Uh, but in the north, there is just this tremendous amount of diversity. At these three village sites here in red, I should say these are all exclusively archaeological village sites where they grow in the uh, western end of this, you know, quote, disjunct. Uh, they're more closely related to the Shushwap easel, which... Um, you know, it was kind of the furthest you can go overland to get your hazels. Uh, there's also this unique genetic cluster, uh, purple cluster here of hazels, associated exclusively with the Kalem village of Dalkyalkia, where it's just these massive, massive hazel forests surrounding the archaeological village site. And then I want to just call attention to this green uh, haplogroup here, which we've uh, called Temlaham hazels. These are associated exclusively with an area known as Temlaham, which is the origin city of many Simshan, Gixan, and Nishka peoples. This is a, you know, thousands, thousands of years ago is an epicenter um, that's detailed in the Adao in the oral histories. And so for us, this is unequivocal evidence that ancient hazelnut management and transplanting resulted in this, this differentiation again calling into question what is wild how is diversity arrived at and to what extent are people acknowledged in that process but it also shows the importance of local histories you know the the genetics team when they got this output they were kind of like what do we do with this you know they had no clue how to interpret it until you start looking at it side by side with the adao with the laws and oral histories of people Because of that connection um, between plants and, and archaeological sites, another way to understand this kind of, you know, ancient land use and stewardship practices is, again, to look at the broader cultural landscape. And so following the hazelnut trail, if you will, it became pretty clear pretty quickly uh, that it was part of a larger modified landscape. The hazelnut was part of a larger modified landscape. And this led to the reemergence of spachgangan. This is a Gixan word, which means a place where you garden in the forest. And we now loosely define forest gardens as these semi-open broadleaf forests of small fruit and nut trees, fruit shrubs and edible herbaceous root foods. So some of your fan favorites like Malus fusca, this very crab apple, um, soapberry, tons of species of vaccinium, prunus, rubus, um, fritillaria, wild ginger, all, all sorts of just important edible and medicinal plants. 
Now the assembly, I, I, I list all those plants. Their assembly, of course, will vary slightly from site to site, but they are all very similar in structure and function. So these are 14 uh, forest garden sites that we've now identified throughout BC. And recently, Alex McAlvey, Sarah Gonzalez, Joyce Lecomte, Mastenbrook and I, these are all ethnobiologists. So you, I'm sure you've heard of them. We've been working with them on you know, identifying whether or not this pattern continues south of the border, because of course this border doesn't exist. And, and so we have found similar patterns, or I should say we were invited to places where folks from community knew that this was happening. And it confirms that it, it does continue into the, the US. Uh, the majority of these sites, I should say, are, are relict. Uh, this is a term that, you know, isn't great, but is something I've heard by elders. These are relict sites because they haven't been managed for anywhere from the last 100 to 150 years as a result of colonial removal policies. And so this is an example of one of these uh, forest gardens here on the Harrison River in Chehalis country. And it's called Clumwaddle, which literally means a place of plenty and a place to get food. You can see these are mixed hazelnut crabapple stands here. Uh, there's Morgan with his total station when we were mapping the area. And my graduate student recently defended his thesis um, and, and he just did incredible work looking at phytolith remains in and around what we know as the forest garden today. So we kind of ventured into this outside area and, and based on that work, we found that the forest garden was actually much larger, probably much larger than it was or than it is today. And so we're looking at these remnants with conifer encroachment being one of the main uh, management problems today. Collectively at all forest gardens, um, we found perhaps not surprisingly that indicator species are things like ha uh, hazelnut, crabapple, another important berry in root foods. And we also found that they constitute, we did inventories of all these plants and compared them with these periphery conifer forests on the edge of these ecosystems. And, and what we found is that they constitute a, a much more biodiverse system as, as you can imagine. And in a paper a few years ago, we looked at functional diversity indices between these paired sites. So looking at the functions of these species together as a system. So we looked at something like seed mass, um, which was significantly higher in the forest gardens. And so that's telling us that there's just a lot more larger seeds in the forest garden. And that makes sense. These are the economically important parts for people. Also, seeds are harder to self-pollinate and, and may require an extra hand, literally a human hand to propagate. And so right away, this tells us these species aren't likely to assemble without some kind of commensal relationship with people. Similarly, animal dispersed and animal pollinated species are much higher in forest gardens, meaning that forest gardens are the result of animal movement. And of course, humans are included in that category. But on top of that, this suggests that after people departed from the villages and or were forcibly removed, forest gardens began providing uh, a lot of unique habitat and resources for animals and pollinators. These are, you know, huge biodiverse breaks and otherwise continuous conifer forests. And so at all these sites, moose, bear, and deer are very common. And the elders know this. They've always said this. I'm always told that old villages are the best places to hunt. In addition to the stuff growing above ground, the soils below also tell a really interesting, so, uh, interesting story. So I've been working with uh, my friend and colleague, JT and Desi from Kitslis and our student, Alyssa. Uh, JT is a soil scientist from UBC. And over the last three years, we've tried to be, tried to characterize and better understand what he calls dark earth development or Tsimshan dark earth development. And so what we're looking at here is our, a profile, a profile shot of the Kitslis Forest Garden. This is in a, the Kitslis Canyon, that first image of the cultural landscape. This is in that area. Um, 
And you can kind of see, so this is the village site where all, you know, the 17 longhouse platforms are right near the Skeena River. Um, and then above that on a terrace is the forest garden. And then behind that are these kind of slowly encroaching conifer trees. And the forest garden is associated with this really nice, dark, organic, rich soil that's very distinct from the classic podzols on the edge of the periphery forest at the back here. Uh, podzol soils are very common in the Pacific Northwest. But they're also, uh, these soils are also very distinct from what we're seeing, um, you know, in the village core, those, those big, dark black mixed midden deposits. They don't look like that either. They kind of have this different um, dark earth development. And so we sampled each of these uh, soil types by horizon and Alyssa, our wonderful student, uh, has analyzed these for pH levels, ammonium, nitrate levels, exchangeable nutrients like aluminum, calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium. And she also looked at the carbon nitrogen ratios. And what we're looking at here is the CEC cation exchange capacity. Um, we're also looking at nutrient loading, uh, like ammonium, nutrient concentrations, uh, phosphorus down here. And what all this is saying is that the, the organo mineral layer in the forest gardens are, are very carbon enriched compared to other soils. They also have a pH of 3.99. Um, which is kind of a key tipping point in soil chemistry because it shifts from positively charged soil constituents to negatively charged ones, which means they have a greater capacity to hold nutrients. And they are holding nutrients that are bioavailable to all the plants, the mycorrhiza and the microbes for use. And you can see this kind of distinction. These are the forest garden soils, kind of topsoil, your organic horizon and AH compared to the conifer forests. And again, here you're seeing that some that difference of these simian dark earths as we're calling them. And interestingly, you know, speaking of dark earths, uh, there's a lot of similarities from studies in the Amazon basin where the ambient soils are typically oxysols, which are very similar to podzols. These are mineral, mineral rich, small organic horizons. Um, and those oxysols compared to Amazonian dark earths exhibit very, very similar traits. To these paired sites. And ethnographically, there's similarities too. Amazonian dark earths were managed by burying and discarding organics. And we know from the Adao, from some Shan oral histories about children and others playing with fish guts or playing with fish bones, fish would come back and exact their revenge because they needed to be buried properly. And so there's kind of this direct evidence of fertilizing, even just from the stories of how to treat fish. Uh, as I alluded to at the, the beginning of the talk, these accounts of, of, of land use, of forest management, forest stewardship, they completely reject coloniality and colonial assertions that persist in our classrooms, in our governments, and in our courts. One example of this is that First Nations in BC who are seeking uh, restitution and land claims in BC courts, they're tasked with proving that they used their lands. And so the Chilcotin test here outlines three gold standards for this, which is a nation to prove their title have to show continuous, exclusive and sufficient land use prior to 1846. This is the magic number uh, because that's when, you know, America and Britain decided, okay, the Britons will get everything north of the Columbia, British Columbia, and the Americans will take everything south. Of course, that, that line moved north a bit, but effectively it's the date of sovereignty, the signing of the Oregon Treaty. Now, the historical ecology and ethnoecology of all this work I've been talking about has ended up being important and useful as evidence because the data we collect is often situated in a nice temporal spatial context that the court's myopic view of indigenous land use can understand. The new Chatlet rights and title case, which concluded last year in the BC Supreme Court. Um, in that case, forest gardens and orchards like the one here were part of the streams of evidence produced by the nation because the crown, 
the government was frankly using very uh, racist and outdated ideas about New Chatlet people, you know, claiming they were dispersed hunter gatherers, that they didn't use the land, that they abandoned their territories. Our research, of course, showed the very opposite. I compiled uh, archival, legal, environmental data, and we surveyed the extent of uh, land stewardship histories in New Chatlet, Pahuti. And just as one example, this is Apple Island, where there's hundreds of Pacific crab apples, and it's truly one of the most amazing sites I've ever seen. First of all, the apples are massive. If you know this species of Malaspusca, they don't get too big just in their, their circumference. They're, they're quite small. But here, they're the size of oaks, and they dominate the canopy like an orchard. And in the understory, there's all sorts of other edible plant foods like rice root, spring bank clover. It, it's really just a spectacular food shed that was managed by New Chatla people in the past. And interestingly, one of the earliest settler colonial accounts I found of fruit tree management anywhere on the coast came from New Chatlet or just outside New Chatlet. Uh, this was from Gilbert Sprout in the 1850s. He was, uh, you know, just a kind of British, British magistrate that ran a, a, a logging company down on the southern end of the island. But he said, the natives are, are as careful of their crab apples as we are of our orchards. And it is a sure sign of their losing heart before intruding whites when, in the neighborhood of settlements, they sullenly cut down their crab apple trees in order to gather the fruit for the last time without trouble as the tree lies on the ground. The um, material evidence of stewardship, even just quotes like this, or some of the data that we collected that I've talked about, can translate very succinctly into land use rights. To quote um, Chief Jordan Michael here from New Chatlet, he says, these forest gardens demonstrate how our laws were activated through our people and through the living knowledge of the land and water. Our forest gardens were not tended by the British. They were stewarded by my people long before the queen even knew the taste of a crab apple. Now, every one of those 14 communities where we've identified forest gardens, there's, you know, the the... There's a lot of interest in the archaeology and the historical ecology, but at the end of the day, I get the same questions again and again, and that's how, how do we bring these places back to life? And so we've worked with community garden coordinators, hereditary leadership, and others working to reestablish forest gardens in community. Um, the, the, again, the soil analyses, the ethnographic data, these are all instrumental in our process because we're setting up experimental Plots, trying to recreate that soil matrix we find in the village. We've taken hundreds of cuttings of uh, forest garden species to see which can root and which can be propagated. Uh, we've hired arborists to come in and limb these massive conifer trees that, that are really starting to, to shade out the forest garden species. And we're also looking at management strategies and objectives derived directly from elders like Gwynanit and Kathy are from New Chatlet. Um, who are helping breathe all of this knowledge back to life. Okay. As we finish up here, I just, I, I want to kind of close in, in talking about the, about ethnoecology and about the society, because it's, it's something that's really near and dear to my heart. And I want to point out the power of ethnoecological perspectives and all this work, which is that we are really focused on the interpretation of culture and environment. And that might be different than say um, a lot of our colleagues in ecology or archeology span who, who tend to focus more on human adaptations to environment. And this might sound like a not so subtle difference, but it actually ends up being a, a huge difference in my experience, because in this context, we kind of take this, this hyper regional, very culturally, persp uh, culturally significant or culturally specific point of view. Um, and while these things can't be modeled or scaled up as easily as, as this approach, 
I think as we do this, we become a lot more in step with the decolonial turn. And, and we're seeing that ethnoecology is, is becoming a fundamentally anti-racist and anti-colonial discipline. And, and as we see that happening in our field, I also want to point out that we come by it honestly. This is something we've been thinking about for a long time in her brilliant book in 1996, Virginia Nazarea wrote, ethnoecology demonstrates Western scientific ignorance about other people's ways of thinking and doing and points out its arrogance in dismissing anything that is different as being inferior. And so in that light, just want to double down on the idea that there's still a lot of reframing and decolonial turning that needs to be done. Because in Gixan context, forest gardens are firmly situated in something called Gwilhyans. Gwilhyans is this philosophy or a mindset, and it's described by Don Ryan Hanamuch here as this kind of 360 view uh, of the land, so looking forwards, looking backwards, but also encompassing this, well, Yance encompasses all the responsibilities of people to ensure that lands, waters, and forests are protected, not just for, you know, children, but for the grandchildren and gr the grandchildren of their, their grandchildren. This is something he, he iterates often. But on top of that, it's not just a philosophy, and, and this is important. Gwilyans is a legal obligation of the WILP, of the house group, that drives all the behaviors and attitudes towards places like forest gardens. And that's not something that I've ever been able to really capture in like grant writing or in the courts, or even in our concepts as we talk about biodiversity and functional diversity. The data and the research is, is definitely still important. I'm not saying, you know, all the soil science and the, the traits indices, I'm not saying we reject that completely, but the caveat is that by its very nature, it tends to erase the core values of the spiritual and relational view of the land. It tends to erase Gwilhyans, you know, that people worked really hard to make peace with salmon, that people worked really hard to make peace with hazelnuts. And so as ethnoecologists, I think we just need to keep thinking about how we make peace with our own colonial biases and agendas. And, and you know, I am cynical at times because ideals like Gwilhyans um, aren't recognized by the state. But if research isn't situated in Gwilhyans or whatever other relational viewpoints, um, you know, where does that leave us? And I'll, I'll end on that cheerful question because I don't know the answer, but maybe it's something we can continue to think about um, over these talks organized by Andrew, Daniela, and Steve. And I, I think our next talk will actually deal with many of these things next fall, but I'll leave Andrew to, to give you all the details on that. And with that, thank you to all these wonderful people, part of the research, my mentors and friends. Um, and of course, for today, thank you to the Society of Ethnobiology. It's given me all, all of my my inspiration and support I've needed over the years. Thanks very much, Chelsea, for that great talk. Lots of claps and hearts going up across the Zoom for you. Uh, folks, we've got the Zoom bandwidth and the time for a, a couple of questions here. Please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, please turn on your video as well if you're gonna if you're gonna talk so that we can have a, a face to kind of uh, relate to in that sense. And of course, uh, we've got a, a chat here as well that you can type some questions in. But absolutely, thanks again, Chelsea. I don't know how to raise the hand right yet, but uh, this is Annabelle, and it was really very inspiring uh, to hear what you have to say and um, think about the legal and moral that versus the philosophy, I think, is in Western science erasing uh, different ways of knowing. <laughs>
I don't know. I, I that's something to think about. I mean, it's not something I haven't thought about, but I I just say, okay, different ways of knowing. But really, it's your legal situation is putting you in a in a position to make those more fundamental. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's so nice to see you, Annabelle. And we've we've chat. I know you've been in in similar scenarios with your work down south, and it's so nice to see you. We've got some questions coming through in the chat. Uh, have you and how do you address the issue of Indigenous community displacement through these losses of knowledge use practices? Uh, questions around how we measure and think about functional diversity in complex ecosystems without kind of a methodological questions, without uh, stopping and including every little friend that we find. Uh, and thinking through your last comment on hyper-regional data and uh, this imperative, shall we say, to scale uh, everything uh, that is somewhat at odds with some of what you're talking about. Holy smokes, that's a big line of questions. Uh, maybe I can start with the... What was the first one? Uh, dealing with... Uh... But how do you address the issue of indigenous community displacement resulting in uh, loss of knowledge and land use? I mean, that's a big question. And I think as a researcher, it's like, that's the whole drive for a lot of this work is like, I mean, whether it's from reserve system implementation, you know, put it, forcing people onto an area that's, you know, 0.1% of their previously larger territory and, and Indian agents enforcing those those reserves with fines and imprisonment. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's such a massive, massive, it's the wheel of, of colonialism and it continues today in resource extraction context. You know, I think for the Americans here, sometimes you might think Canada's got this great relationship with indigenous people. That, that is fundamentally wrong. You know, I was on a, I wasn't there, but I, I had friends who had, you know, machine guns pointed at them by the RCMP, forcibly removing them from their land five years ago. So this isn't like, you know, something in the past, it's still happening. And so I think part of our, um, part of, of like action oriented researchers or whatever you want to call it, um, is to also not just confront the past, but but what's going on now and the, and the real material supports that people need now. Um, and so, yeah, that looks like a lot of, uh, work against pipelines, work in support of hereditary leadership in the North. It's going to look different for each community, but, you know, there's also a lot of community led resurgence work going on. And it's like, we don't need to like, like with the forest garden work, that's not led by me. That's led by folks in community. And we're just like, what do you need? What do you need data? Do you need funding? Do you need this? Like just being that kind of supportive material infrastructure type support system. Um, yeah, those are some thoughts. Thank you. I know I just like dumped all of my questions at once <laughs> just oh, so I wouldn't forget them. Oh, that was all from the Yeah. Oh, nicely done. Yeah, it was all me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just cause like, this is something I'm currently thinking of right now. Cause I'm writing my grant proposal for funding for my own work and research for my dissertation that's very similar to what you're doing just in a different community and different uh, ecological context because it's in Belize uh, like Dr. Ford's. Um, so it's just really interesting to, and I love hearing what you have to say of, of how you go about your work and, and what motivates you and how, how you handle this is just amazing. <laughs> so thank you so much, it's very inspiring. I mean, yeah, you just, I, I always say like, you just got to be okay with taking orders, right? Like I'm just a workhorse. That's it. That's exactly. really all it is. It's, not, it's nothing like, you know, <laughs> groundbreaking. Uh, but you, to your other point about the functional, tri I mean, this is hilarious. Cause like, it, it's funny, you know, every sub-discipline of like ecology and biology now are like, you know, I had a 
an entomologist like we should study arthropods in forest gardens and then a microbiologist is like we should study soil microbiome in those soils like you could just pick your field and like replicate the thing in that forest and yeah the traits was like um something alex McElvey, who's another longtime member um him and i had just kind of thought up one night i think probably at one of the meetings <laughs> And uh, and then we found someone who was who was able to kind of look at that with us. So yeah, any direction. And then what was the last question? How do you uh, like succinctly state like a proposal or uh, a statement about how why and how hyper regional data is a value to like the global context? specifically yeah. when you're writing for funding or writing for publication, because it's kind of part of a, a jump to not explain every little detail and every little bit of context. Um, <laughs> at least it so, is for me. No, it's so true. And I, I'm sure some of you in the um, here have also like dealt with this, like, so that, that, that soil scientist, JT, he's, he's amazing. But he's like, okay, we want to think about this, you know, this Kitzlis forest garden. But like, you know, if if we want to publish it, we need replicates. And I was like, no, you don't. Like, it's not, this isn't, yeah, like, yes, let's do the replicates. I'm not saying we reject those ideas completely. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, I think too, it kind of, this idea of trace centrism, like that there's, you're kind of just looking at snippets. It's, you know, in archeology, span almost everything is N1 until someone comes in and organizes it the way they want, you know, old multiple stone tools, and then, but everything is is in space time N1. And so I think thinking of hyperlocality in the context of archeology span has been really helpful. But again, when it comes to grants and things like that, I just, oh man, the, the bullshit radar is on high. You know, this is gonna change the world and food systems and bar, you kind of just, you know, play it up and then and then do the good work on the ground in community and, and leave it at that. I don't know, that's a, I don't know. I just got opinions, I don't know. <laughs> it's just... Thank you so much. I, I love your opinions. <laughs> yeah, you should reach out, just send, shoot me an email. I'm curious to hear more about your work, cool. One question from the chat. Uh, what special considerations are needed with attempting to identify potential forest gardens that would be in now urban areas? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Because um, one of my friends and colleagues, she was, um, uh, she works at Musqueam, or she used to work at Musqueam First Nation, which is, you know, effectively Vancouver. And uh there was a bit of a sadness. I, I gave a talk to um, to Musqueam elders group uh, about forest gardens and, and there was a lamenting because it's like, God, if we had any, they're, you know, not here anymore. But in fact, there you can kind of like, whether or not a place is an ancestral forest garden bona fide, there are places in Vancouver where there are, you know, um, assemblies of a lot of forest garden species and i think you can kind of, it doesn't have to have the the mark of the thousand year midden or whatever that's just that's a forest garden and the nation can take it on and and rebrand it as their own and um you know find these little pocket parks in urban areas to to kind of you know take back <laughs> and i think that that's one way that that Aviva, my friend, was thinking about it in, in Musqueam. Um, yeah, another good question. Folks, I want to encourage you to check out Dr. Armstrong's uh, website and reach out. Uh, that information is there in the chat. And with this to say, uh, oh, we've got one more at the very last minute. Go for it, Megan. Sorry, I'm in a loud kettle. I was waiting for a little bit of a, um, a lull in the sound. But I just want to say it's super lovely to hear about this group um, and to hear about plants. Um, because as a faunal archaeologist, I find that they're super underrepresented in my own work um, and in archaeology more generally. So I just wanted to say thank you.
Um, and I'm going to be reaching out. I hope that's all right to learn more about my job. Oh my God, I hope you do. And Steve Wolverton's here. Our like our joke that will never get old is like the trophic problems in our society is that it's overwhelmingly plant people. So join the crowd. We need more more faunal folks. The more the merrier. All appreciations. Welcome, folks. Our next installment of this series will feature Dr. Jennifer Krenz. Uh, and we'll be hearing lots of great things uh, as well out of the Pacific Northwest. And of course, our upcoming conference is going to be in May, May 21st through 24th uh, in 2025 in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. So please reach out, get involved, uh, and learn more of the wonderful things that our friends and colleagues are doing. Uh, thanks again, uh, Chelsea, for today. And to everybody else who's watching, uh, this is going to go up on YouTube so we can see it later. And uh, folks, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. So nice to see you, Evan, Ginevra, Sage. <laughs> There's some good friends in there. Cool. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Steve.